Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the virtual archaeology talk, canines and mythology and religion. If you're checking in and would like to use the closed caption uh, function, you will be able to find that at the bottom of your screen. You can just click on the CC button to activate it. And during the talk, if you think of questions you would like to ask our speakers, uh, you can put those in the chat and we will address the questions at the end. Now, welcome to the virtual archaeology program. This is always virtual and it is always related to the archaeology collections at the museum. Uh, related to uh, ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome, the Americas, and we want to branch out and connect to other cultures as well. We talk about objects in the collection and it's a chat, it's a talk. And that means, whoops, sorry. That means that um, it's almost like you're sitting by the fire uh, on a dig listening to archeologists talk. And now I will try to bring myself back on the screen. Um, Thank you. Strike my video. It was not working. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Cameron and Luke who are wor working behind the scenes um, to help us today. Uh, so let's get this program started. My name is Caroline Rochelot. I am the curator of ancient collections at the museum. And I will be joined today by two of our staff members, Angel Gonzalez Lopez who is the research curator of ancient American collections. I've been working with him since I think 2018. And also joining us um, is our new addition to the curatorial department, Sean Burris, who is the curator of Judaic art. Um, in the description for this event, you probably saw that both Angel and I were listed as archeologists, but Sean was listed as an art historian. Um, but I'll let you in on the secret. He's actually also a trained archeologist. Sean, do you have a few words to say about um, that, your role at the museum and <laughs> the dichotomy, art history and archeology? span Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in my area of study, it's really less of a dichotomy than it's a close co collaboration. And I think that's something that came out in a lot of our, our conversations so far. Um, is that we all really love the fact that archaeology brings together perspectives from a lot of disciplines. And I think we have a lot of experience with that. It's also something I really love about working in a museum with a global collection is that it tends to bring people in uh, to research and to uh, work on objects from a variety of disciplines. Um, so, you know, within the study of the ancient Mediterranean world, Art history and archaeology are very, uh, very closely linked uh, historically, too. Um, actually, the discipline of art history really emerged from archaeology, uh, early archaeology um, in Italy and in Europe. Uh, and art history really emerged as a, a, a sub-discipline of that. Uh, but I'll let you in on another secret, which is that my degrees are actually in religious studies. So when you start talking about the Eastern Mediterranean and the Jews of the ancient world, a lot of that is studied in departments of Near Eastern languages or religious studies. So really my career, and I do have a, a decade of working in archaeology um, uh, abroad and particularly in Israel, my career is a great illustration of there's no one single correct way to approach uh, material culture from the ancient world, archaeology from the ancient world. Uh, and I know that's true for you too, Angel. I know that you are bringing to the table a degree uh, in anthropology. So right. uh, maybe you want to share a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. That's absolutely true because in the Americas, um, archaeology is part of anthropology, you know, the study of, uh, of humans in a holistic approach. But I think archaeology by nature is uh, collaborative. We have um, multiple voices uh, speaking about same thing, but using different methodologies, we can uh, look for really tiny uh, particles, uh, pieces of the universe like the DNA, or we can use a telescope and study cities from the space. But... Um, Today, I'm excited to discuss our ongoing collaboration. 
As we all know, our research on ancient canines spans different parts of the world, the Mediterranean, Mesoamerica, and Egypt. It's fascinating how these various cultural contexts shape the relationship between humans and canines in unique ways. But let's start. Caroline, could you tell our audience about the importance of canines as gods in ancient Egypt? Absolutely. Um, so I'll get the ball ro rolling on uh, myths and religion um, that feature uh, canines. For ancient Egypt, our death dogs, in, in quotes, if you will, um, they're quite numerous. There's a lot of them. And I will not speak about all of them, only one. I'll focus on Anubis today. But what I wanted to show you is... These three most popular one, Anubis, Wepwawet, and Dwamutef. And at the bottom of each um, illustration, and you can see uh, the first one, Anubis, that's an object in our um, collection. I've put little hieroglyphs that show you how these deities are typically portrayed. Um, and you'll notice that for Anubis, you see the um, person with a canine head. I mean, this is very typical of Egyptian deities, where it's um, an animal head on a human body. But if you look at both the, uh, not both, all these three deities, you can see that all three of them could be depicted in this way, or it could be a crouching figure with the head of the canine. So it's very difficult sometimes to figure out which canine you're talking about, unless the name is there. If there's a name in hieroglyph, so it says Inpu, Anubis, you know it's Anubis that is being represented. But sometimes there are no names. Um, another thing I need to point out with these um, animals, with these canines, is that they, we usually call them jackals. Um, but they're not entirely jackals. Um, you have features of other canines and perhaps a little bit of the wolf here and there. So it's almost like a composite, little features here and there that created this jackal. And it should be known that even though most of them are depicted black, there's no such thing as a black jackal in Egypt. So it's already a construct, black, the color uh, associated with rebirth and uh, Osiris, for example, uh, and we'll come to that a little bit later. Um, these deities are all associated with the funerary realm, and that's actually quite um, important. Um, and why would that be? Well, perhaps because scaven uh, jackals are scavengers, and I'm going to use the term jackals because it's the easiest way to um, describe this mythical um, jackal, um, are scavengers and probably would have been seen near cemeteries in ancient times, in the pre-dynastic period, when you only had shallow burials in the ground. So it is probably from that there that this idea of the jackal associated with cemeteries um, came from. And in our conversation um, on hell, um, we've noticed similarities between ancient Egypt and the Americas, and some of your uh, deities are also associated with the underworld, aren't they? It's correct. Um, first, uh, a little bit of, of context. Uh, context is important for archaeologists, let's say. The advanced uh, Mesoamerican iconography allow for the accurate portrayal of the 80s, showing their unique symbols and features in pictures and sculptures, making it easier for the people to recognize them. Each deity had specific symbols that identify them, and also some elements that were shared the combination uh, of these symbols was usually uh, distant for each being. Usholotl on your left was the god of twins, the ball game, double things. He was the one who descended into the realm of the dead and accompanied the sun through the underworld, leaves this realm along the sun and causes it to rise in the east. He was the deity adorned with uh, the appearance of a dog, if you look closely to the image. Uh, the term Xolotl distinguishes uh, all beings of dual nature, 
that's why this character was called the god of twins and the monstrous. Tex uh, mentioned that this uh, word uh, referred to the double ear of corn, the double ear uh, of um, agave plant, and as well as the stone hand for grinding. The other can canine on this presentation is the Aztec gold god Huehuecoyotl, uh, uh, the old coyote, often uh, referred to the um, to the old coyote, probably, or uh, the English term well, coyote came from uh, the indigenous language, Nahuatl. But Huehue Coyotl played various roles and held cultural significance in Aztec mythology, particularly in the realms of dance, music, and artistic expression in general. He was also associated with a period, of, period dedicated to artisans and artists. Individuals born during this period were believed to have talent as singers, storytellers, and craftsmen. However, they were also through to be susceptible to excess and could lead to physical decline. The picture of uh, Wewe Coyote often feature uh, a human body with the head of a coyote. Next, please. Thanks. <clears throat> While Xolotl, Ancient Mesoamerican belief held that the sun set on the western horizon and uh, it embarked in, on a journey through the depths of the Wonderworld, reaching its lowest point at mid, uh, midnight before beginning its gradual ascent to reappear in the east. Xolotl was the one who descended into the realm of the dead and accompanied the sun through this region. But also, Xolotl participated in cosmogonic myths of great importance to humanity. In one of them, the gods ask their mother to provide them with the power and means to create humans who will serve them. In response, the goddess suggested that they go to the realm of the dead so that the lord of this realm, called Mictelantecutli, will give them the bones or ashes of past humanities to make sacrifices. So the brothers and sisters agreed that the god with the dog's head will go to the underworld. The Xolotl did so. Mictlantecutli pursued him, causing Xolotl to, to fall. The bones he carried, which was the long as an arm, broke into fragments on different sizes, which is why it said that humans come in various heights. Later, Xolotl collected these pieces and took them to his brothers. They placed them in a dish and drew blood over them. For the for four days later, a boy and a girl were born. But um, you can recognize Charlotte by his insignia, a kind of feathers made of feathers, the curved shell uh, earplug. But I think the most important uh, is uh, the wrinkles on his face. The significance of uh, uh, ancient Mesoamerican uh, dogs in Mesoamerica where they play integral roles in rituals and daily life is truly intriguing. Now let's shift our focus to the Mediterranean and explore the different perspectives and cultural significance of dogs in that part of the, part of the world. Sean, what insights can you share regarding dogs in the Mediterranean? Thanks, Anhal. Um, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that's emerging for me from this conversation is that dogs, at least in the mythology uh, and, and religion in, in ancient Mediterranean and particularly Greek and Roman, are serving a very different function um, in a way, or, or there's some real, real differences. They're, first of all, they're not the top gods uh, of, of the pantheon. They don't play such a central um, role, or if, if I want to make a, a, a pun, they're not the top dogs, if you will. <laughs> um, they, they're rather, um, their functions are, are a little different and they're a little demoted in sort of the cosmology or the pantheon, if you will. Uh, they tend to be kind of monster figures or, or hybrid figures um, in, the, in the mythology. Um, and uh, their their functions stem less from kind of dogs in nature, as we saw with uh, Caroline's jackals and these composite figure uh, creatures who emerge from seeing jackals at, 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 at funerary sites. Um, 
they they stem from their long domestication and their long and close relationship with humankind and the roles we see uh, of for dogs in in the house and in society. So you know there there are two I would share with you today, two really prominent dogs that feature in Greek and Roman myth, and the first of those is Severus. Uh, Severus, um, importantly, one of the overlaps here, Severus does have a very important funerary function and association. Um, he is uh, uh, a figure that, um, uh, or, or uh, a dog who uh, has anywhere from between three and a hundred heads, depending on the repetition of the myth. In art, he tends to be represented with three heads, and we'll, we'll see that more in, in a minute. But he's a figure who protects the underworld. He's kind of a guardian figure emerging from that, the way that dogs are known to protect houses, if you will. Uh, he's friendly to the occupants of the underworld, but he's there to keep people who don't belong in the Greek and Roman underworld out of Hades, out of the underworld. And he, he's, a, he's a guard and attack dog in that realm. The other dog uh, that exists really um, prominently in Greek and Roman myth um, is the uh, legendary she-wolf in Roman myth. Um, so this goes to the very founding of the Roman people and, and, and the city of Rome. Uh, the first king of Rome, uh, the twins Romulus and Remus, who were abandoned as, as infants in the wilderness, and taken to and taken in by um, a she wolf and suckled and and taken to her cave and raised uh, with wolves for a short period of time, and so you're seeing a representation that of that here that's in the Capitoline Museums at the heart of Rome today, uh, ostensibly potentially an Etruscan figure, uh, maybe uh, an Etruscan bronze sculpture also has been dated as late as the medieval period by by some scholars. To answer that, we'd have to bring in a conservator and another discipline entirely, uh, but we won't go there today. But yeah, we see we we do see um, uh, some of of. A, a great deal of overlap there uh, between the figures um, and also in terms of the funerary realm. So I think today it might be helpful to dive deeper into the funerary roles uh, that some of these figures, mythical figures play. And so maybe Caroline, you can speak a little bit more about that uh, in the context of Egypt. Yes, absolutely. And I will actually start with, by showing you images of Anubis in the museum's um, collection. And um, it's always a fun exercise trying to go and find something very specific in the collections, and then you realize how many there are. Um, Anubis is represented on several artifacts at the museum. Um, you see Anubis right here on the foot of the coffin of Amun Red. You see uh, this image that we already saw earlier, uh, Anubis as a reclining jackal. Here, this is from the coffin of Jed Mut. Um, this is actually a really <laughs> close up of a hieroglyph uh, on the false door of Ni'ach Snefru. And if you look here, um, this is a rare occasion to look at this particular Anubis because in the galleries, you won't see it. It's on the back of the box, uh, the Shapti box of Penpahenti. Now, this one is also a close up. This is from the Gilded Mummy covering. And you see Anubis tending to a mummified being here, uh, resting on this uh, lion-shaped um, funerary bed. And again, Anubis here um, on the coffin of uh, Jed Mut. And these represent actually the important roles of Anubis in funerary uh, religion in pharaonic Egypt. And these roles are quite simple in a way, guide or protector of the deceased. And you can see this with this wonderful coffin sarcophagus mummy assemblage right here from the Ashmolean Museum on your left. Uh, and Anubis is right there at the very top resting at the foot of this um, wood um, sarcophagus, protecting the content, so the two coffins and the mummy inside. Um, the one in the middle is probably the most beautiful uh, representation of Anubis you'll ever see. And this is from the 
the tomb of King Tutankhamun, the Anubis um, shrine, which actually has uh, poles and can be carried in procession um, on the shoulders of uh, priests. And that little shrine represents tombs um, and cemeteries. And perhaps the most important role of Anubis in Egyptian funerary um, religion is the god of mummification. And um, I mean, these are very important roles. The Egyptians are all about the preservation of the body and making sure that a person can travel the underworld uh, safely to get to the afterlife, the realm of Osiris. So extremely important roles. That being said, you don't find an Anubis in a lot of myths. He's not necessarily the hero of the myth. He's almost always in the background. And the most important myth with uh, Anubis is actually the myth of Isis and uh, Osiris. Um, to make a long story short uh, for today's purposes, um, Osiris was killed by his brother, Seth, and at some point in the story, his body was dismembered and the body parts thrown all over um, Egypt. Osiris's wife, Isis, went and uh, found and brought back all these body parts. And together with Anubis, the body was put together and mummified. Um, and Isis, being a great magician, revived Osiris but he could only live in the world of the dead. He could no, no longer live in the world of humans. So Os Osiris became the world, the god of the underworld. Um, so that's the part that Anubis uh, played in this uh, myth. Where you will see Anubis uh, mentioned, and perhaps more importantly, illustrated is in the Book of the Dead, which is that sort of AAA guide to get the deceased to um, pass all the hurdles and uh, lakes of fires and all the things that could um, hurt you and make your trip very perilous. Um, this is sort of your guide to how to get to the other side safely. And you will see Anubis uh, represented on those vignettes as the guide holding the deceased by the hand. Uh, or looking to ensure that the scale where the heart of the deceased is weighed against the feather of truth, the feather of Ma'ath, just before entering the realm of Osiris, he's making sure that the scale is working properly so that they have a fair judgment. So this is where you'll see an, um, Anubis represented most frequently. And this is actually what you see on the coffins and the material um, culture that I just um showed you. Now, I know the underworld in ancient Greece and Rome is not quite as uh, nice and lovely as the Egyptian um, one. So how about you tell us a little bit more about what's going on in the Greek and Roman underworld with Severus, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. So Severus does feature prominently in a couple of kind of core or important myths. Um, and, and foremost among those is the, uh, the, the myth of Heracles and the 12 labors. So because of a um, kind of particularly heinous crime, Hercules was sentenced to 12 years of service uh, to uh, another king and or, or, or an ancient king and to doing these 12 particularly harrowing trials or labors that he had to undertake. Uh, and this appears in a number of ancient sources, and it also appears in a lot of ancient art, the Hercules' 12 labors. Um, and the last, the, the 12th and final of those 12 labors was Hercules had to go down to Hades, down to the underworld, and bring back Severus, um, this, this, this terrifying monster, um, from the underworld um, and present him to uh, the, the king, Aristheus. Um, and uh, so we see this actually appear on a number of Greek bases like this one right here. This is a, a Greek crater from uh, Altamora in southern Italy um, that shows the spread of Greek culture across the ancient Mediterranean at a certain point of time. 
And, you know, I, I really like this depiction because it, it shows something I've been talking all about already is the way that um, Severus and, and other dogs like Severus are understood um, along domestic lines in the in the Greek and Roman mythology. And so and in, and the art and archaeology as well. So you see here Severus depicted, yes, as a rather t terrifying um, hybrid three-headed animal. He's also given a snake tail, and that's a reference to um, some of his other ancestry. His mother and father were both part snake hybrids. Um, but you also see him with, with collars, and Hercules is dragging him um, by a chain, things that um, are immediately interpretable today, if you will. Even if we don't see three-headed dogs, uh, we, we at least um, are familiar with dog leashes and dog collars. And Hercules is said to have... Um, you know, uh, really, uh, he, he went to Hades, asked for permission to bring Severus back, and he was told, sure, if you can. And he, he basically, Severus, uh, Hercules, this, you know, who's known for his might and his strength, had to wrestle Severus into, into submission. Now, you know, you, uh, you can advance to the next slide, if you will. One of the, the things to, that I, I like to bring out here is the difference between uh, the myth as it appears in uh, ancient literary sources, um, and as would have been encountered um, hearing it in performance or, or, or uh, encountering it in, in written sources, or as it appears in art. So Severus in the sources, in the literary sources we have, um, and, and in the mythology, is variously described, as I already kind of referenced, as having three, anywhere from three to a hundred heads. Uh, and I would challenge anybody here to go and try and draw a hundred headed dog. Not only would it be incredibly time consuming, but I imagine you'd run out of paper. It would no longer fit on the body of a dog. Uh, it would be really challenging. And ancient artists confronted that problem as well. And so the, in, in, the, in the visual culture that we, we've excavated or that we see coming up from the ground, there tends to be uh, a pretty definitive coalescence around this idea of of Severus with three heads. And a great illustration of that is this, this hydria from um, Cervetary, uh, which is in the Louvre collection, and that depicts Severus with three different colored heads. Um, but also uh, plays with that idea of his heritage um, and that we see in multiple sources of, of his being also part snake by putting these kind of snakes along his mane and his snout and his feet. Um, so he's really, you know, the, the, the literature, the mythology leaves a lot to the imagination and makes the Severus into this terrifying, grotesque figure, um, whereas the art has to even kind of further dis domesticate him a little bit um, in order for him to be intelligible uh, to us. Unmute. Um you're you're telling us about this three-headed dog, and this is the image that pops into my head of Fluffy, Hagrid's three-headed dog who guards the trap door in the Harry Potter books. Um, and uh, yes, a rather fearsome um, creature here guarding people or preventing people to go beyond the trap door. Um, and this is only possible when Fluffy is uh, fast asleep and in in the books and in, in the uh, movies this is done by the music played by a magical harp um, is there a connection with the actual myth on that level uh, as well absolutely so yeah on the on the level of music so fluffy is severus right um fluffy is definitely coming straight out of lifted straight out of greek uh myth and again illustrates that idea that that he's a guard dog, uh, Severus is. And uh, this idea that you can lull him to sleep with music is probably drawn from the myth of Orpheus, which appears in a number of, of um, uh, sources, but probably most prominently in Virgil's Aeneid. And in, in that myth, Orpheus has lost the love of his life, or Eurydice, who has died. And Orpheus undertakes an, an epic journey uh, to the underworld to retrieve her, to bring her back from the dead. Um, and you see this myth continue into the present day in operatic works um, and in a number of different sources. Uh, and Orpheus, one of the one of the first barriers to finding his lost love, Eurydice, is 
uh, Severus. And Orpheus is known as a, as a Greek god for his music playing and the power of his music to accomplish different things. And, and one of the things he accomplishes in that journey to the underworld is, is the way he, he, he gets past Severus as he plays him this beautiful music from his lyre or from his heart to lull him to sleep. Now, interestingly, this is not, unlike Hercules and the Twelve Labors, uh, while Orpheus does appear in a, in a number of ancient um, artworks, including some wonderful mosaic floors, uh, some sculpture as well, uh, the the image of or images of of this myth of Orpheus lulling Severus to sleep, um, I've not I've yet to encounter in, in ancient art. So what you're looking at here is the imagination, the the sculpture of an American artist, Thomas Crawford, um, who, like a lot of American artists of the 19th century, were deeply inspired by classical mythology and classical literature, uh, and did this really fantastic in 1843 while while living and working in Rome. Wonderful piece, uh, Orpheus and uh, Severus, or relating to that myth. Uh, so yeah, uh, Fluffy is is coming directly. Fluffy and the way that Harry Potter and those um, Gryffindor Rugrats were able to uh, to circumvent him with with some some music that's coming straight out of uh, that's straight from the book. Um, and I also know that there's a link between music and dogs in uh, Mesoamerican culture, right, uh, Angel? That's correct. Well, we start to see certain similarities and differences across the, the the world. But let's turn and focus on Wewe Coyotl. I think um, I mentioned previously his role as a musician, but also he has other uh, activities. Here in this uh, slide, you can see certain aspects of this Aztec deity. On your left, uh, Wewe Coyotl is dancing. That posture is uh, telling us that he's in the middle of this uh, frenetic dance. He's holding um, uh, rattles and flutes. And in front of him is the important deity, Xochipilli, the god of dance, uh, music, artist too. He's singing. And if uh, you look closely to the speech scroll, uh, it's adorned with a flower. That is, uh, that means it's a flowery speech, music. It's a, a very metaphoric uh, uh, image. In the middle, we have um, a drum made of wood. Right now, uh, uh, Museo Nacional de Antropología and National Museum, Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. And on your right, uh, is portray, uh, portraying Wewe Coyotl, yes, as a musician, you can identify him by his uh, coyote head, right? And he's uh, holding with uh, his uh, right arm a rattle, but on the other one, he's holding uh, shields, weapons. So next, please, let's focus on other aspect of the uh, Wewe Coyotl. He was uh, uh, believed that he was a, a magician with different talents. Now I'm going to explain you in detail these couple of images, but uh, I would like to um, keep your attention to these uh, two images. And you can see that Wewe Coyotl is holding with his uh, right arm, a human arm. True, but why? It's because he was a thief. He was a magician that the Aztec, the Aztecs called the Magpalito Tique. So within the Owl uh, men, a group of magicians know for their malevolence and health and in fear and disrespect by the people that the Magpalito Tique were particularly notorious for their peculiar methods. They had engaged in acts of desecration and theft while the extent of their threats might have been exaggerated, it's noteworthy that accounts, historical accounts, mention individuals receiving death sentences and convicted thieves, thieves being executed through the use of hypnotic enchantments. There are some stories about thieves in ancient, the ancient city of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, who had to induce a soporific state in the inhabitants of the houses they robbed, ensuring that no cries for help will be heard 
from the outside. The people's creativity attribute these effects to the improper use of severe arms of women who died in childbirth, like the, those present in these two images. This woman is div divine in nature, also warriors who grasp a, a captive, companions of the midways, so until it's said in, in the West, who give the power of apprehension upon the whole band of these thieves. Also was um, an icon, um, an object for good, good luck in the battle, in warfare. After a special mortuary rites, the relatives would bury them at a crossroads, the, the woman who, child, who died in childbirth. But despite the vigilance of their king, the Temakpalito Tike, the magicians, will seize the corpse, mutilate it, and take with them the arm of the deceased, like this. The use of detached, uh, detached forearms uh, from the corpse of a woman who died in childbirth gives the Temakpalito Tike their name. Literally, it means those who make people dance in the palm of their hand. There is an indigenous phrase in Nahuatl, the Aztec language, that makes this clear. I'm going to um, provide uh, the, the terms in Nahuatl, the Aztec language, and later uh, it's uh, the translation. Aso tequanal wale, coyonaguale, that is, perhaps he has the wild beast, beast as his spirit animal, perhaps. He has the coyote as his spirit animal. But talking about the funerary aspects, Sean, what do you have on the other part of the world? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, to, to pick up on that thread that's kind of been going through the conversation about this funerary aspect, um, but to move it a little away from the, the divine, from the mythology, one of the things we see in the Mediterranean um, in funerary uh, art um, kind of across the Mediterranean is this association of um, animals as pets, uh, as companions in the afterlife. And what better companion uh, than, you, than, um, than a dog, uh, as a dog's uh, as a dog person myself, um, uh, I, I, I can immediately relate with things like this wonderful funerary altar of a young boy um, that's uh, from the first century and is, is Roman and shows a, a young boy um, with a dog cavorting at his heels. And, uh, you know, the, the unlike Severus, this dog is just serving in a very friendly um, companion capacity. Uh, something we're familiar with too today. Um, you know, I think this is this for us is a more relatable <laughs> image, uh, more um, immediate association, um, and kind of a, a natural uh, extension of our relationship with with friend I see in the chat. Uh, absolutely, uh, and we see this in Egypt as as well, right? Right, Carolyn. Yes, um, very often we associate the ancient Egyptians with cats um, as their, you know, favorite uh, animal. And I think the Egyptians liked all animals in in, in general. Um, and you actually do see representations of ancient Egyptians with their. Um, uh, sometimes we're called like personal animal as opposed to a pet, which is a very modern um, term. Um, and here we have uh, Hu and his dog on a leash. So you will see these scenes uh, with a person and um, a favorite animal sitting underneath their chair uh, and things like that in ancient um, Egypt on coffins, on tomb walls um, as well. So there's parallels there. So back to you, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I think is maybe important to point out is we don't really have evidence for whether these these children and 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 the dogs and other pets are in Greek and Roman funerary art very often or most often associated with uh, funerary art for for children um, as opposed to adults. Uh, maybe something appropriate to the to, to childhood, but you don't have. Um, 
we don't really have evidence to know whether these these kids really did have these these are these are actual dogs that they had or whether this is just kind of an appropriate motif a wish of companionship and lifetime we don't have sort of remains and of dogs interred with the the children who are um, associated with these tombs one of the things I love, though, as a curator of Judaic art and something that I've, I've done some research on, uh, one of my favorite pieces from the Jewish community of Rome comes from the Catacomb of Monte Verde. This little lid, um, uh, a sarcophagus lid uh, that would have served as the top of a, of a marble coffin uh, for a young child from uh, the second or maybe third century um, of Rome. And it's a portrait of a young boy reclining, uh, the deceased. And he has a number of little motifs around him, including these birds on either side of him. But underneath his hand um, is this little tiny pet dog who is is interacting with him very playfully. And he's kind of scratching its ear. Um, and you know, uh, when I, uh, I mean, this is something he's, he's essentially laying on, on his couch and playing with his, his pet dog. And it's really touching and really immediate. And it's one of these moments, uh, for me, it's always been one of these moments where that, you know, centuries and, and millennia that separate us from the past kind of collapse and we can, can see ourselves in the past a little bit more immediately now. So We've been talking, though, about, you know, dogs as companions or and friends in, in Mediterranean culture. But I know it's not exclusive to Mediterranean culture either. And we see this this kind of common companionship uh, in, in Mesoamerica, too. Right on hell. That's correct. Um, just to remember, dogs, descendants of wolves in in the Canis genus, held a unique place as one of the few domesticated animals in pre-contact Mesoamerica. Their presence alongside humans dates back around 14,000 years, indicating a direct association between these two species, humans and dogs. It's believed that dogs may have uh, journeyed to the Americas with uh, early humans' migrations, often assisting in hunting and offering protection and friendship, if I can say. On Mesoamerica, archaeological findings reveal dogs alongside human remains, some dating back around 3000 BCE. In certain cultures, dogs were raised and consumed as food, typically reserved for a special occasion, believe it or not. Not this custom is present in different parts of the world. But Mesoamerican beliefs incorporated dogs into human burials, either as uh, actual remains or represented in form of certain ceramic vessels. Now, as you can see in this uh, slide, there's a model from Western Mexico. All these materials from Western Mexico, Nayarit, Colima, Jalisco state area. Um, the prevailing belief that was the dog served as a, a guide for the deceased, deceased across the body of water to the underworld. In this context, uh, dogs often represents a connection between the living and the afterlife. Next slide, please. But um, more uh, closer to us, excuse me, we have this movie, a Pixar movie, no, that is based in, in, in ancient beliefs. So in this slide, you can see uh, a surely squintly that it's the, the name uh, the Aztec give to this uh, hairless dog. But it's, it's called in the movie uh, Coco. His name is Dante, the charming and loyal Cholitz Quintly dog in Coco. Uh, it plays a pivotal role as Miguel's great grandmother's Coco's pet. Despite his initial appearance as typical pets, Dante becomes essential to the plot. He accompanies Miguel, look, to his journey through the land of the dead, offering support. He's portrayed as a Cholit Quintly, a breed with deep roots in Mesoamerican cultures like Aztecs or Maya. Esteemed by these civilizations, Cholos were believed to guide departed souls to the afterlife and were even buried with the deceased in Coco. Dante's role connects to Mesoamerican beliefs emphasizing the dog's historical importance in guiding souls in the afterlife. These beliefs are still present today. Next one, please. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, these beliefs, uh, the journey, the travel to the underworld. In the ancient Aztec belief system, dogs held a special place with profound ritual significance. They saw in the dog's image a representation of fire because the teeth, particularly the kind of uh, that descends from the heavens, like lightings. According to uh, their beliefs, it was this lighting that opened the earth, creating the path to the underworld. But traveling this dangerous route requires the guidance of, uh, of a faithful canine companion. In the cosmology of the Mesoamerican people, the universe was organized into a complex, complex uh, stratified system, both above and below the Earth's surface. The celestial realm was intricate, comprising a sequence of layered heavens on top, of course, each associated with specific natural phenomena. While pictorial representation of the 13 heavens exists, notably in the Codex Vaticano A from the colonial period, as a commercial, we have this uh, book in, in the libraries as a new acquisition. So you can check it it's over there. Mirroring the celestial order, the underworld was similarly structured into nine distinct levels, maybe the months of the, of the pregnancy for humans. These layers held sig uh, significant meaning in the ancient worldview forming a complex and stratified understanding of the cosmos as a totality. The journey of the departed soul was no uh, simple matter because after four years of traversing the nine levels of the underworld, they would arrive at a vast and impressive river, the Apanoguayan. Here uh, you can see the arrow uh, uh, pointed out the, the, this river. And you can see the head of a dog on top of this. As the soul reached this occasion, its gaze met the eyes of a dog. If the dog recognized its owner, it would make a leap, plunging into the river to swim to the other side, bearing the soul upon its back. It was these loyal canines that the indigenous people kept and raised with great care. This journey, will inevitably be part of our passage through this world. There is nothing more common than death and dogs. But Sean, do you find something similar in Mediterranean art? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that um, we see, at, you know, in, in this association of um, the funerary realm, um, a little more rarely, uh, but we, we do encounter it, is dogs and dogs sort of natural prey instinct. And and one of the, the pieces in our collection that I like uh, is this Hadra Hydria, which actually comes from Egypt, from the site of Hadra, uh, a funerary um, uh, a cemetery. Uh, and this would have been used as an urn. And it depicts a, uh, a dog on the right there, um, kind of doing what comes naturally by instinct to it, challenging um, this, this ibex to the left, this kind of deer, uh, deer, deer like animal um, common in the Mediterranean. And, uh, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about something that we haven't talked about that much on how you've alluded to it a little bit in a few of the, the pieces you've talked about, uh, but about the ways that that, um, that that aspect of dogs, that, that ferocious, instinctual prey drive, um, we see that in the archaeology and the art. Uh, one of the things that we see in a lot of Roman art um, is hunt scenes, and and we see the dog inextricably tied with uh, the Roman hunt. So you're looking at some uh, wonderful, really wonderful mosaics from a, a fourth century villa um, in Sicily, the Villa Romana Casale. And an ancient villa was this sort of rural um, uh, estate uh, that was grounded in agriculture, but one of the activities for the elite there would have been the hunt. And uh, 
the in this mosaic called the the room of the, the small hunt mosaic at the Villa Romana Casale, we see a number of different depictions of dogs being involved in various stages of the front. And I've just picked a few of them here. There's really a, a plethora of examples. But on the left, you see a, a dog um, taking part in a successful return from the hunt of a boar. And on the right, you see uh, a couple of dogs being used um, working together with a human to hunt a fox. Uh, and we know uh, the, that dogs were used in this way by both the Greeks and Romans. Um, they were used to hunt a variety of small and medium game from deer to, to foxes, to, uh, to boar, uh, to rabbits. And uh, but they weren't used for the more exotic hunts like uh, lions and, and elephants. Um, there are whole treatises, in fact, that are written by ancient uh, Greek and Roman authors on the use of dogs in hunts and what types of dogs was, were appropriate for what type of hunt. Uh, but the, the hunt is definitely w one place where we see um, this this again, this domesticated relationship between humans and dogs, but taking advantage of a different aspect of the dog's personality. So not its, its, its loyalty or its companionship, but its prey instinct instead. Um, but that's just, again, this testament to this, this long evolution and re relationship. Another place where we see in the art and archaeology where we see dogs prey instinct or, or, or um, kind of more ferocious nature being taken advantage of are in um, mosaics like these uh, from Pompeii that attest to the use of dogs as um, guard dogs. And we already saw that in Severus, right? We saw Severus as a guardian of Hades. He's, he's tasked not with people pe keeping people in, but he's tasked with protecting the realm of Hades uh, and, and keeping people out. And that is very much uh, a real function of dogs already, in, at least in Roman culture, um, as we, we see from these um, mosaics at Pompeii. And the one on the left is one of the more famous and fun mosaics um, from, from Pompeii because it shows this guard dog uh, with a collar and a chain. Uh, and the, below in Latin, it says, Cawe Canum, beware the dog. Um, in other words, something that you could go to Home Depot today and pick up on a sign for your house if you have who um, either acts as a guard dog intentionally or you can't quite control. Um, but, uh, you know, it's another one of those moments where that distance between the past and the present collapses a little bit for us. And we see the things that that kind of continue culturally. Um, do you see this on hell? Uh, and um, in, in Mesoamerica, this sort of prey warrior instinct? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's uh, especially in Wewe Coyote, no, because he he's uh, he's present with weapons and, and and similar scenes. Because in the world of Mesoamerica, the coyote play a fascinating dual role, representing both the rapacious predator and the deity of dance and song. This feature was shaped by the the create the creature's sensual inclination. And its musical ability, giving it a unique place in its cultural costume, as a symbol of a warrior, much like the eagle and jaguar, of course, the coyote was often seen using sacrificial knives, uh, eating human hearts, as in the image on your right from Teotihuacan. The the this trilobe figure is a human uh, heart in in Teotihuacan iconography or hunting in mural paintings at Teotihuacan, as I mentioned. Warriors sometimes even assume the form of coyotes in the dances and battles, emphasizing the animal's connection to the martial pursuits. On the flip side, the coyote also held associations with death, the underworld, and maze. Curious. Parallel to its uh, canine counterpart, historical texts Tell us that Wewekoyotl, who was believed to show, to solve discord among humans, leading to wars. This connection with conflict and discourse led the Otomi people in central Mexico, an indigenous group, to honor him with the rite known as the Festival of Discord. The Codex Nural, another book that we have in the library, no, it's a new acquisition. 
on your left on uh, this uh, slide further illustrates uh, the coyotes were like attributes depicting all coyote where we call your arm with a um an atlatl uh, a dart throwing device as well as a shield and arrows is fully armed he's a soldier other times wearing helmets as protection as the image at the center now it's a helmet or made of mother of pearl but using a helmet as a protection these elements underscore the association of what we call you with uh, martial activities this narrative paints a vivid picture of the coyote's intricate role spanning from predator to deity and the rich symbol symbolism it uh, carried in the mesoamerican world but caroline um, do your dogs have this violent component? Um, well, yes, in a way where when we're talking about um, the hunt, for example, which we do see in ancient Egyptian uh, visual arts, um, here we have a lovely example of the king actually hunting a lion with a dog, with uh, probably a hound. Um, so you, you do have that aspect of the 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 fierce nature of the dog um but when it comes to deities unlike we um i can't even think of a canine deity in ancient egypt that has that fierce uh warrior um aspect to it um they really tend to be guardians of the dead protectors of the dead, um, from Anubis to Duamutaf to uh, Webwawet. Um, and th that's sort of interesting because even though a jackal is not a domesticated um, animal, in Egyptian religion, it seems to be a very benevolent um, uh, creature that really is the best companion for the deceased. And um, as we're closing this, this talk, I just wanted to share with you this amazing sculpture um, from the Vatican uh, Museums of Anubis wearing a toga, where in this case, it's sort of blending ancient Egypt with ancient Rome and Anubis becomes equated with uh, Mercury and uh, later on also <laughs> becomes equated with Saint Christopher. So, and that's like a talk for another day. Um, and um, I just wanted to end um, the presentation with this wonderful image of this hybrid uh, Anubis slash Mercury um, figure here. Um, if you have questions, uh, please place them in the chat. Um, we'll answer them now. Uh, Cameron will be fielding these uh, questions um, to us. If there's a specific person that you want to ask the question to, please make sure you put the name um, so that we find the correct person to answer your question. And I will uh, actually stop sharing my screen so that you can see our faces much bigger on yours. So do we have questions? In the chat, we actually have quite a few. Oh, and excellent. Yes, and the first actually comes from our tech support, Luke, who <laughs> <laughs> wanted to know, he says here, it looks like there are plenty of depictions of dogs as deities in ancient Egypt, but are there examples of dogs as work animals? Um, I think the work animals would be the uh, the hunting dogs. We also have, um, and I, I'm trying to find images, but I think dogs were also used as police dogs um, in ancient Egypt, but I don't recall uh, images of that. Um, but other working animals, hmm, other than a hunting dog or a guard dog, I don't think so. Herding, um, cows, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I, I haven't really come across, to be honest. 
We definitely get the the herding. So not only do we get the guard dog function um, and the hunting function uh, for dogs in Greek and Roman um, art and, and, and literature, we know they were used by shepherds as well. And there was a particular breed, the Molossian, that was kind of the predecessor of the modern day Mastiff that was associated with um, shepherding. Um, you know, again, that's that's the guardian of the flock. It's not uh, my understanding is that those dogs were not so much doing kind of the cattle dog nipping at the heels, helping things keep in line, but they were protect they were protectors there again. They were 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 guard dogs of a flock, but they worked well in concert with shepherds, um, uh, keeping the flock in line and protected as well. In the Americas, I don't think so, but this is an interesting question. Um, in the archaeological record, I don't remember any reference yeah only for protection even hunting it's hard to prove it's a it's a big difference in this well uh with that being said first thank all of you for those answers uh ellen h wanted to know would dogs have been killed to be included in the tombs I think that's probably a question for me. <laughs> um, you do have some animal mummies, well, a lot of animal mummies in ancient Egypt. Dogs are part of that. Um, and you, in some instances, it feels like some of them may have been um, pets or, you know, personal animal companions. Um just because of the way they were mummified. I think there are some instances where there uh, is a dog in a burial. Most uh, of the dogs uh, killed for burials are not so much burials um, the way you're thinking, like the tomb with the deceased. They're um, the animal mummies of the late um, periods where the animal mummies are made as votives or presents to the deities and these are offered um, for the animal to bring whatever message to the gods. Uh, the Egyptians believed that animals had souls and the soul of the animal would tra travel uh, and bring your message to the deities. And then those are buried in catacombs where you'll have thousands and thousands of these uh, animal mummies, whether dogs, cats, ibises, just about anything could be mummified in ancient Egypt, but that's a different ritual um, aspect from the funerary realm. Well, in in the Americas, yeah, we have many examples uh, actually. Uh, historical texts in close to the contact with European societies, there is plenty of uh, references uh, that uh, dogs were killed to be placed in the tomb of the owner and the way that they kill these dogs the reddish no <laughs> not the white not the black dog no the reddish only was to place in an arrow on the neck so sometimes it's, it's usual to find these uh, offerings in tombs but also i remember um, i excavated that that offering in the great temple of the Aztecs in downtown Mexico City. And no dogs, no coyotes, but wolves, a lot of wolves, like 15 wolves were sacrificed and placed, placed in, in an offering, probably were killed. With that purpose, hard to say, no, but yeah, we have this evidence. So, you know, I'll just speak really quickly to the the ancient Mediterranean and kind of like uh, on hell, we have literary evidence. We have ancient authors, ancient Roman authors in particular, who write about dogs in a couple of particular rituals being used as sacrifices for the gods. Don't really have archeological evidence for that practice or dogs as sacrifices, dogs killed to be included in tombs. The nearest thing archaeologically we have is actually from the Eastern Mediterranean, very interesting phenomenon at the site of Ashkelon, which um, is a multi-period site on the coast of Israel. 
Uh, and uh, at one period of its history, it was a very important Phoenician site. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, a thousand before the common era. So, very, you know, first millennia, um, uh, 3000 years ago. Uh, one of the things, and that's a site that I excavated at, at one point, one of the things that Ashkelon is known for is its dog burials. Hundreds of dogs have been found buried um, in individual graves together uh, in, a, in, a, in an area of, in a particular area of Ashkelon. And there's, you know, we don't have text to explain why that happened. Um, we only can uh, postulate, but there's no evidence that any of those dogs were killed um, uh, deliberately. Um, uh, all evidence points to deaths of natural causes. And one of the leading theories about why those dogs were buried together is that they were held to be sacred, sacred to potentially the goddess Astarte, um, who later on becomes linked with um, uh, Greek and Roman gods like Diana, uh, and a dog was a particular companion. This was a, a female deity who was a hunter, among other things, and the dog was used in hunting. And so were these dogs at Ashkelon part of a temple precinct and considered kind of sacred um, uh, uh, and associated with the gods and, and allowed to live um, uh, full lives and then buried with respect and reverence appropriate to kind of these these companion dogs for the, the goddess of the temple. Uh, that's one of the, the leading theories about this phenomenon, but it's a very curious phenomenon. Um, hundreds and hundreds of dogs buried individually um, at Ashkelon. And, uh, it's a puzzling one. So our next question comes from Renee K. Uh, I hope I said that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. And they say, boys, yes, uh, but do you have scenes of women or girls and dogs at all? And then followed it up by saying dogs are not equated with women much. And why is that? So the, if we're talking specifically about the funerary imagery um, and these images of pets, that is really pretty gender neutral. I happen to use an example of two boys, but um, you know, one of my favorite examples of pets and children is a wonderful Greek uh, stele at the Met that shows a young girl holding a pet dove. I'd have to go back and look, um, but I don't have any reason to suspect that dogs as pets were closely associated with um, with with boys more so than girls. Um, and certainly this the, the larger category of pets as appropriate companions in the in the for real people in the funerary realm is not is it does not or transcends gender. Uh, when it comes to the mythology, you know, the example I didn't really go into today is the goddess Diana, goddess of the hunt, uh, uh, among other things. And there are wonderful myths um, where uh, she's she tends to be accompanied by, by dogs. And you see this in uh, some ancient sculpture as well. Um, and you also see this in our galleries. We have a wonderful Paul Manship um, a pair of, of sculptures, bronze sculptures that show Diana and her hounds and the god Actaeon, who um, Diana essentially hunts down and, and her dogs rip apart, uh, rip into shreds. So, you know, the we see this as well um, with women, but by and large, the hunt um, was a gendered activity in Roman, um, in, in Greek and Roman culture, and shepherding was a gendered activity in Greek and Roman culture. So it is deities, female goddesses who can sometimes transcend that. Um, but, but by and large, we don't see the hunt and um, uh, shepherding so much with, with, with women. But the pets, I'd have to go and look. It's a great question. I, I can't immediately recall an image of a young girl with a dog, but I, I could probably find one. And I think I can probably add a couple of things here uh, from the ancient Egyptian perspective. Um, most of the funerary uh, death dogs um, are pretty much all male dogs, but you do have uh, maybe like two or three who are female, but much more obscure. Uh, I think for Egyptian pantheon, you might find more female deities associated with cats <laughs> or felines, I should say. 
Um, but in terms of uh, personal uh, animals in tombs, you can see a, a dog underneath the chair of a woman or uh, a man. It doesn't um, matter. Um, and you'll see all sorts of animals, uh, baboons and gazelles and all sorts of other pets, if you will. Um, and of course, you see them depicted everywhere on the coffins of women. Um, so there's there, there's no bias there. Um, Anubis will protect uh, everybody who dies and travels to the underworld. And for the Americas, uh, especially in Central Mexico, the Aztecs, I don't I, I don't remember uh, women with uh, associated with dogs or uh, goddesses. No, mm, uh, because uh, the Aztec were uh, an estate, uh, pretty masculine worldview. You no, know? is uh, especially on the top of the, uh, the social pyramid. On the base, it's a different story, but in this part of the the city, is 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 yeah, it's, it's kind of oh, this world dedicated to warfare, the glorification of death. It's pretty masculine. But in terms, I think uh, um, there is no difference between genders. Uh, the only difference is um, the way of your death. Uh, that is uh, the result of your final destiny. If you died in, in warfare uh, in the sacrificial stone, your destiny was the heavens the, to accompany the sun. But if you die from normal death, you travel to the underworld. In in that context, you needed a, a dog. So there is not a big difference between genders in, in the Americas. The Aztecs, I mean. Okay, so our next question comes from Luke yet again. Thank you, Luke. Um, it is for on hell, and it says here, is the KK Koyato a representation of a coyote? If so, why do coyotes often get stereotyped negatively as thieves? Yeah, I try to show you different images of, of mm, this uh, this canine no and to show you to provide you with different activities for this one of these was uh, not only this kind of funky uh, perspective the the thieves yeah no it's a kind of a spooky activity being a thief of a human arm but i think most of uh, aztec deities are representing natural phenomenon, as Caroline mentioned, with the uh, jackals. Uh, coyotes have this feature that there are scavengers looking for for food, no matter the, the origin. No, the, the only thing in their mind is to have food. No, the means doesn't matter. But also, where coyote has this component of uh, Joyful, if I can say, no, it's, it's representing this part of human life that's enjoyable. It's, it's, it's dancing, chanting, gathering with your community. Excess also, no, is part of our life. Um, drinking, drinking alcoholic beverages, pulque is, is another part. Um, but also for the Aztec, I'm, I'm speaking, they viewed other ethnic groups as different, no? And they had the stereotypes. And one of these groups um, was the, is the Otomi people from the northern part of Mexico. My family came from this, this ethnic group, the Otomi, and the Otomi, they love to to drink uh, pulque, this alcoholic beverage, and they are different. So in this stereotype, the, the Aztec stereotype, they depicted the difference in with these components of 
they're thieves, they're, they are not like us. And yeah, so I think that's that's an answer. Oh, I'll try. <laughs> I don't know. I think you did a wonderful job. Uh, our next question comes from Amy. Oh, this is a fun one. Have your respective disciplines affected how you've named your pets? I considered a segment for my cat, but decided to go with Persephone, parentheses, Persephone, if you will, since she has a less pugnacious connotation than the Egyptian deity. Like, I, I'm going to start because that's going to be quick. I'm allergic to cats and dogs. So I don't have pets, but I do name my plants and um, plants have personalities. And one of them is called Nefertum, which is an Egyptian um, god. So, but, you know, they have also weird names or names that are meaningful to me. But then again, plants, not uh, pets. So I'll let the cat owner and the dog owner uh, talk about that. <laughs> Yes, um, definitely. Yep. Please, no, please, Angel. please, please. No, Angel, we already saw your cat, so we know who <laughs> she's talking about with the cat. <laughs> he has an opinion. Why only dogs, right? The more important animal in the universe, maybe, are cats, according to him. Of course. Yes, it, it's it's an issue. It's inevitable. It's, once you start to read and drink in all of this information, no, it's, it's I think it's, it's part of the job. And it's is the the fun part no yes i have like 20 names for my cats many of these uh, are in Nahuatl. the most recent is uh, he's black my cat and his name is robert uh, the official one but i call him uh, ishtlilton that is um, an aztec name for we can translate ishtlilton or uh, like uh, the tiny black, something like that. But yes, definitely, <laughs> it affects a lot. Yeah, and I think, um, so my, 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 my dog is named Lila, which is the Hebrew word for night. And, um, you know, I, I, if it was a, and it, it's a, it's a beautiful, it has a feminine ending, Lila, the A, -A H ending. Um, and, you know, the way you say good night in Hebrew is the same way I say good dog, Lila Tov. And I, I've trained her in Hebrew for a while there. Uh, and, you know, if I if I, I ever had a boy dog, Boker, Tov, Boker is actually not that uncommon of a dog name. Boker is uh, morning. Um, and so Boker Tov uh, is how you say good morning. And I might do good morning for a boy dog. But, um, yeah, definitely I, it has clearly influenced all of us here. Uh, how could it not? That is so great. I love it. And um, our final question comes from Ellen H., who says, there are so many connections among these three cultures. Might you all comment as to why this occurred? Did this happen coincidentally, or was there communication through migration? Was Thor Heyerdahl correct? I'm going to answer, well, we can all pitch in, but the common thing between all of this we're all human. We're all human. That's my answer. If you guys want to follow up, go ahead. And I think one thing that comes out of this is that essential to being human is a relationship of some kind with dogs, whether you're allergic or not. <laughs> you can't you can't totally avoid dogs for millennia now. I mean, humans and dogs have interacted across cultures and, and developed a close relationship. So, you know, the the answer, first and foremost, to me is coincidence that is it's, but it's not entirely coincidence. Right. Because it really derives from these natural relationships that emerge um, given uh, are sort of predispositions and, and instincts and dogs have natural capacities as animals to be prey, a prey instinct, a guard instinct, a uh, scavenging instinct. And these things, you know, appear whether a dog is in Mesoamerica or Egypt or in Cyprus. I mean, a dog is a dog all around the world, just like a human as a human, uh, wherever you encounter a human, um, very similar, uh, you know, but at least when it comes to Mediterranean and, and Egypt, there is some 
direct communication. Greece and Rome long looked to Egypt as the birthplace of civilization. Um, and I think Caroline's last slide showing Anubis in Roman guise shows that there was some knowledge of the importance of dogs um, in Egypt. And so while we don't see direct borrowing necessarily that often between Greece and Rome and Egypt when it comes to dogs, there's definitely a shared world culture of the Mediterranean that, that underpins some of this and, and some of the overlap could be explained that way. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful question because uh, allow me to, to make this, this thought that, yeah, we are humans. And I think uh, with, we used to think alike. And especially in these turbulent times, I think we, we need to focus on that. You know, what, what, what makes us humans instead of focus on differences uh, and we love pets. We we are friends with these animals. Dogs are incredible um, animals. This is we are, have been together in a fantastic journey exploring the the world, and yeah, we travel to together. We eat together. Uh, they love us. Uh, they love humans. You no. Know? <laughs> We we are a different animal, no. Sometimes not a cool one, but we have a close relationship. We are more than friends. I I think the, and one of the goals of this this talk was to share that to, to share that we are not so different, no. It's um, yeah, and, and finally, yeah. At one point, the Americas. Uh, disconnected with the rest of the world and we have a sporadical connections with that part of Asia and and other parts of the world but yeah I think um, we in this part of, of, of the Americas we developed uh, an, a similar uh, uh, beliefs uh, based on the the observation of these canines. And I think I will wrap it up. You you made a good point on on hell, um, showcasing the the connections, and that's the actually the whole point of this lecture series is looking at archaeological uh, material collections, ancient cultures, and making those connections. Um, and today we focused on what we do have in the collection: ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and ancient Americas. But in future talks, we hope to go beyond the collections of the museum, but always using them as a starting point to uh, go even further um, into Asia, native uh, cultures, um, go into Africa um, with different themes. So that's really the purpose of, of this talk is to use the material culture of humans and uh, contrast and compare um, and do that virtually once a year. Uh, the second Thursday of October, which is Archaeology Month, <laughs> lo and behold. Um, and um, our closing remarks, thank you all for uh, joining us um, today. Thank you to Luke uh, for doing the tech stuff in the background. Uh, thank you to Cameron for um, it's like moderating the Q&A. And uh, we hope we see you before next October for our other programs. Um, we hope you come to the museum if you're nearby. Otherwise, we'll see you online later on. Thank you so very much for joining us today.